Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is safe on this Saturday. First and foremost, I want to thank our panelists as well as our students for participating in our last alumni panel event for the spring 21 semester. I can only imagine what it has been going on this past year and how we've had to learn to pivot and navigate our new normal. Now, I don't know what the next normal is going to look like, but I'm sure it has to be better than this. So I hope everyone is OK. For those of you who don't know, my name is Sharon Stroy. I am the Director of Public Engagement in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. On behalf of Dean Minifil, our faculty, staff, and students, we would like to welcome you to Human Resources and the Future of Work. The Office of Public Engagement, along with the class of Professor Michael Dillard, decided to put this conversation together to highlight some of our wonderful alumni. It has been an absolute pleasure to see where our alumni go in their careers, the organizations that they take over. Literally, they are running the ship. So before we get started, it has been my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, as well as our panelists. So please be patient and hold on as you listen to who they all are. And because our moderator is Professor Michael Dillard, but he is also an alum of SPA. So it's great to start with him. Dr. Michael Dillard is an assistant teaching professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers University North. Dr. Dillard previously served as the director of the Rutgers Are You Ready for Work program, where under his leadership, the program created a pipeline of students with 100% high school graduation and college acceptance rates, with about 60% of these students pursuing degrees at Rutgers North. His research interests center around non-traditional students, particularly with students and programs are being created that enable them to thrive. His teaching style focuses on leadership-based courses where students can learn the skill sets needed to manage an organization. His classes feature various guest speakers, off-campus sessions where they come to understand theory meets practice. Dr. Dillard is a contributing author to at least one published book that provides innovative insights to the development and advancement of online instruction in educational technology to engage students from diverse backgrounds. He is also a public speaker on topics of college persistence and long-term care. Audience, please welcome Professor Michael Dillard. Our first alumni panelist is Ashley Alvarez. Ashley graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in public and nonprofit administration in 2016. She began her career in human resources after landing an internship with University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. After graduation, Ashley was offered a full-time position as a human resource representative. From there, she spent the next five years being promoted from one position to the next resulting in the role of talent acquisition and recruiting. Excitingly, Ashley recently accepted a new position at Riverside Medical Group as a recruiter and continues her experience in healthcare recruitment. Welcome this afternoon, Ashley. Our next panelist, Marsha Armstrong became the program director for the Newark Youth One Stop and Career Center in June 2018. In this role, she manages all employment and training services delivered to job seekers across the city of Newark between the ages of 16 and 24 years of age. Prior to advancing to this role, Ms. Armstrong served as the SYEP manager responsible for coordinating the growth, development, and sustainability of the program and advancing it from a program serving 900 youth to 3,000 and more. Her background in early childhood education has made this career in youth development a joy and passion for her. Currently, she manages a staff of 15 
oversees the programming and operational aspects of the Youth One Stop Career Center and continues to coordinate the management of the SYEP program. Marsha holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in public administration and remains active in the greater Newark community as a public servant. Wow, thank you for joining us, Ms. Armstrong. Our next panelist, if I read her bio and all of the amazing things that she has done in a Natasha Hemmings. Natasha is the Chief Executive Officer for the Girl Scouts Heart of New Jersey and the first African American woman in the council's history to lead the organization. A longtime advocate of girl empowerment and leadership, as she is a lifetime member of the Girl Scouts of USA and served Girl Scouts in central southern New Jersey as the chief marketing, marketing and communication officer for 18 years, a lifetime of passion in Girl Scouts. As CEO, Natasha holds a senior leadership role with significant strategic and supervisor responsibilities for the second largest Girl Scout Council in the state with an annual budget of over $6.5 million. Natasha has a master's degree in public administration with a concentration in nonprofit leadership and a bachelor's degree in communications and theater from the College of New Jersey. She holds an executive nonprofit leadership for certificate from Fairleigh Dickinson University. Natasha has been selected to serve on the Girl Scouts of the USA National Convention Action Team for the last four national council sessions. Wow with increasing roles and responsibilities over a 12 year span. Natasha's passion for issues pertaining to women, girls, diversity, equity, and inclusivity has focused her community service in these areas. Active in multiple charitable organizations and committees, Natasha is also a member of GSUSA Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Racial Justice Steering Committee and a proud Leadership New, New Jersey alum. Didn't I say she's done a lot? Mostly Natasha, most recently, Natasha was selected as one of the top 25 leading women entrepreneurs in New Jersey and made the ROI New Jersey 2020 influencer, people of color list. In 2018, she was also recognized as one of South Jersey's Biz Women to Watch and was recognized Citroen Cooperman at their Women at the Wheel with their Leadership Excellence Award. Not only is she a major player, she's an entrepreneur and owns three key events, a wedding and special events planning company. She attributes her success to the unwavering support of her parents, her husband and her two her two daughters and her bonus son Xavier. Wow. Our last panelist and proud to say Kathy Plymel, the Chief Operating Officer for Boys and Girls Club of Newark, New Jersey since 2014. She started as an intern while attending Rutgers University Newark and a student in the undergraduate program in SPA. After her internship, she joined the team and has been hard at work ever since. She completed her undergraduate degree in public and nonprofit administration and her master's degree in public administration at Rutgers University Newark with a concentration in leadership. She has over 10 years of experience in organizational leadership and is passionate about harvesting a happy, healthy workplace with emphasis on strong organizational culture. She has recent, was recently promoted to COO in this capacity and oversees several departments, manages over a $1 million budget. She is passionate about working in the nonprofit field and serving children and families of community in North. It is my absolute pleasure to be the proud alum 
along with our panelists and our moderator today for them to talk to you and share their insights about human resources and the future, especially in the time of COVID. My pleasure to turn this panel over to Professor Michael Dillard. Audience, enjoy us for the rest of the day. Thanks so much, Director Stroya. It's a pleasure to be here, especially on a Saturday with our SPA students, SPA alum, and just really, as we like to call it around here, SPA family. The idea of this event is to not only just talk about the importance of human resources. When it originally started and we came up with this idea to launch a panel discussion, Director Sharon Stroya and I, we were at first thinking about simply including this event for our human resources administration students. But we realized that students in general from SPA, whether at the undergraduate level or master's level, could overall benefit from hearing from their very own, our very own SPA alum, who not only worked so hard throughout their academic journey here, whether going and starting off for an undergraduate degree and continuing thereafter into their master's degree, but they are the prime example of what success looks like. They've gone through those challenges. They've gone through those trials and tribulations, but they also understand more importantly, what it means to be a practitioner, how to overall affect change at the public level. Uh, just some of the challenges in terms of the nuances of what it takes to manage and lead an organization, to galvanize and lead a team. So in today's discussion, an informal discussion that is, I've already sent today's panelists the actual questions I'm asking for our panelists to be brief. I think the true sense of learning will actually occurs during the Q&A. And Director Sharon Stray is gonna assist me with in terms of moderating that portion of the discussion. But I just wanna start off first because obviously since having a spa family here, you know, and I'm quite sure you remember your days, your journey, your time of being a student at spa. I wanna ask you the first question I wanna to pose to everyone. How did your experience as SPI at Rutgers University of Newark help you advance your career upon completion of your degree? So let's start with Natasha. Okay, I have to remember to unmute myself now. So um, my experience at SPA uh, started because I didn't get the job that I now seek, now, now that I sit in. Um, I was denied the CEO job from another Girl Scout Council. Uh, it got to the last round of interviews when the, uh, the search committee said to me, well, you're really great. You know, we know that you have the capacity to do this work, but the thing that separates you from the other two final candidates is that you don't have an advanced degree. So needless to say, I was shocked and you know, reckoning back to my mother telling me after I finished my undergrad that you should just go ahead and get your master's. You should, what are you waiting for? You know, and life happened. But going back and getting my degree from SPA, uh, what it enabled me to do was to fill the gaps that I had in my education and in my experiences so that I could be prepared and ready should the next CEO job come up. And I graduated in 2016. The CEO that I had been volunteering uh, for their council left in 2017, and I applied for the job and really um, started working um, in April. I think yesterday was my like third year anniversary. So it, the, the experience that I had at SPA really filled the gaps for me and allowed me to take on this job or go after this job after disappointment. See, I just followed right behind you, Natasha, then I, I was gonna start talking and then I realized that I actually did not unmute myself. And I just wanna actually say thanks to Natasha because she's doing many things on a Saturday. As you can see, she's in the car, uh, she's attending Girl Scout uh, cookie selling events in addition to uh, assisting the SPA family by serving as a panelist member. So I, I do really appreciate it all because again, it's just about getting down and dirty, rolling up your sleeves where you can and still showing that although she's at that C-suite level, she still has to get out there and making sure to you know, check to ensure that the site and the operations are still running smoothly. So let's go on to Catherine Plymouth, that same question to you. 
Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, I think for me, it's filling the gaps also, um, but also um, as a very young person in the organization. Um, when I started as an intern, um, there were several um, co-workers with multiple years, 40 plus years of experience. So I definitely wanted to be successful and set myself apart um, from others if there were opportunities that were going to open up to me. And so um, I made that decision also to continue my undergrad into my master's degree. So any opportunities that open, I could compete for those uh, opportunities. And also um, I think on the master level, there's a lot of theory and experiences with the professors that you could really apply um, in the day-to-day -day of running an organization. Um, and that's what that degree has really enabled me to do is really reflect on what I've, you know, discussions in the classrooms. We've had a lot of discussions, Professor Dillard, um, about leadership and ethics and, you know, what do you do if this happens in real life scenarios? And that's really enabled me to navigate um, and to make successful decisions uh, in my role today and the previous roles that I've held so far. I like that you put the emphasis on the previous roles that you held thus far, because it was all of those stepping stones that assist you in getting you to where you are today. And not necessarily taking that for granted. When I think about Kathy, wow, she started off as an undergraduate student at SPA. She completed an internship opportunity during the days when students were actually required to complete not one, but two internships, 150 hours each. But it was all of those experiences along the way that actually helped her in really accomplishing a rare opportunity to become the chief operating officer. She makes it look so easy but we know certainly it's not easy at all. Let's go with Marsha. So my experience at SPA really gave me, I would say the confidence to step into a role that I've never worked in before. Um, for me, I came from the early childhood space and I knew how to lead organizations, but not government organizations. And so I had access to professors to ask a ton of questions, um, to reach back and just think of things that I needed to do. And then again, step in front of an audience and get feedback. And so my experience at SPA gave me that full access to everything that I needed to walk in well-prepared for a role that was a pair of shoes that I think that I couldn't fit. And now the shoes I feel a little bit outgrown. It's funny uh, when you use that analogy in terms of shoes, because that's what it really is overall about. It's like kind of like stretching beyond, right? You know, when, when it's, it's this idea of feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, you kind of walked into that position, kind of somewhat doubting yourself, kind of feeling not so sure about it, but it was those spa experiences along the way, that level of academic rigor, and then just kind of getting out there and doing it gave you that own sense of level of confidence. Let's move on to Ashley. It's so funny because I felt like you took the words out my mouth that I was going to say. Um, so the spa program allowed me to experience different variations of the field, um, going there and experience, um, you know, probably 18, 17 years old, I really didn't know what, where I would be in within those four years of my college experience. And um, I just knew that I wanted to go into nonprofit because I wanted to help people, but I didn't know exactly what were the fields. Um, especially it was generalized that it was just be government. Um, but as I grown in the program, you could really dip into any type of business. And the fact that the school was located in Newark and there were so many nonprofits in Newark, um, I was able to walk to different areas because I was also um, on campus um, so that you know, I got my first internship that was a block away at Winona's house. And then I got my second internship at University Hospital, which I just had to take the Rutgers bus to. So just being a student in Newark gave me the opportunity to have those experiences. And then the spa program itself gave me the confidence to feel uncomfortable until I felt comfortable, you know, with meeting people and working with different students and 
working on group projects and presentations where I wasn't fully comfortable public speaking or working in groups as well, gave me the confidence to speak up in meetings during my internships and give ideas, um, which led me to my full-time position at University Hospital and led me to where I am today. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about this idea of spa family, it truly is, you know, a spa family here, you know, in terms of students, in terms of faculty and staff, but more importantly, alumni, and finding creative ways to keep alumni continuously engaged, not just so much in terms of donating money once a year, although that's great, and continue to donate money, but we also need the active engagement throughout in terms of finding those creative ways to keep alumni in the loop, to keep them informed. We want our alumni to come back to the spot to be able to serve on panels, just like we're doing today, to serve as guest speakers in a classroom, to maybe perhaps somehow impact change by providing an internship opportunity at their organization. That's truly engagement opportunities. That's exactly what a spa family is all about. So my question to you today is, how can alumni stay engaged with spa? Can you provide some examples of your recent engagement activities with the school as an alum? So let's go with Marsha. As an alumni, I think um, engagement is always the core of my work. Like I'm always thinking about how can I reach back and grab the person that that's just sitting there. I mean, sometimes it's a student in the classroom that is, that may feel like they're unavailable or a professor that may have a request for you to join a panel or just give advice to a student. I think there are always ways you also have to be creative. Sometimes it's touching base, base with your professors or the old directors or the deans that you've been um, in contact with. Um, for me, on the ground every day working with young people 14 to 24, um, I always have to find program mentors or internships for for college students or young people. And so I'm just reaching back and always looking at SPOT as my first place to look, um, working with, with, the college, with as many college students as I can from Rutgers Newark, specifically SPA, or just um, asking them to serve for me as, as mentors for students that, are, that may be just working on getting job readiness or job skills together has always been my, my source. Um, and then again, I would say staying engaged with the deans and staying engaged with the directors and the professors. If you do that, there is no way that you cannot find a plug at Rutgers Spa. I love that you talk about that. Wow. So it's, it's a little bit deeper than just simply a uh, public engagement or finding, you know, uh, the plug, as we like to call it. But really that commitment when you think about the school mission, you know, and the principles of engagement and what it means to be a true public servant. It's not just simply getting the degree, right? and learning the theoretical concepts of impacting change. But it's more importantly, once you finish that degree, as an alumni, what are you gonna to do to continuously stay engaged though? And that Marsha just put out so many different examples. So hopefully over the next few weeks, we're gonna start seeing those examples come to full fruition by having those alumni responding to myself or Director Stewart. Ashley, why don't you jump in? Yes, I completely agree with Marsha um, that staying engaged with SPA, with your professors and counselors and Sharon as well. Um, I constantly am in connection with um, the careers counselors so that I could bring in internships um, programs to University Hospital when I was there. And I'm going to continue to do that when um, in my position at Riverside um, because for me, I was searching for internships very last minute and I was like, oh, I need to graduate and I can't graduate without this internship requirement. So having that you know, opportunity there for students, um, especially because University Hospital um, is a part of Newark and it's, it's a big part of the community, um, being able to engage students in Newark, I think it's very important. And um, in, in any of programs, you know, with high school and um, community programs as well, I think it's very important. Thanks so much, Ashley. And I think we're, you know, running good on our timing. Then I want to actually pose that to an additional panelist. So, uh, Catherine, why don't you jump in in terms of providing some examples of ways in which alumni can, you know, continuously stay engaged? And what have been some examples of your very own engagement efforts? 
Yeah, um, this is actually one of my favorite things to do, um, being on the panel discussions, and that's one of the ways um, I've been able to stay engaged. But also, um, I think for students, uh, it's, it's really important to do research um, and think about the fields that you like to work in and also um, check those uh, career um, boards that are on the company's website to see if there's any uh, alumni and reach out to those alumni for interviews um, to ask them about you know their careers how's it going um, especially if you're um, trying to learn more about the field um, so one thing that I uh, continuously do I have a lot of students that reach out to me for interviews um, and I'm always very quick to respond to those um, if I can and have the moment. And I've done several one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with students, um, giving them advice. Um, some of it is required for class projects, um, but I've just enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Um, and you know, I've been able to just continue some of those uh, mentorships. So it's just continued into more of a long term relationship and mentoring those folks. So I think as alumni, um, one on one mentorship is good if you have the opportunity. And now, especially in this day and age with Zoom, you know, there's more flexibility to just jump on very quickly and have a five minute session if, you know, someone needs advice. So as an alumni, um, the one on one opportunities are great. Um, and also being on the panelists um, and also speaking in person when you know there's opportunities. I've done some of those too. Um, I love the spa, spa family and I love to stay engaged. So any opportunity that I can engage in, I, I typically do. Thanks again, Catherine. And I think, you know, including also with Natasha, all of our, you know, at least with today's alum panel members, they have been actively engaged. Uh, they have found so many different creative ways to impact our current students' lives or prospective students' lives. I think about it in terms of the times that I've reached out to Ashley on numerous occasions to send students over to university hospital, whether it was for internship-related advice, career-related advice as it related to human resources, or students meeting up with Marsha Armstrong at her office and, you know, Marsha providing paid internship opportunities to a number of my students presenting to a number of classes. And so as the Boys and Girls Club, they've been, you know, continuously engaged with our efforts to not only just simply somehow find creative ways to make sure that students really understand not only how important public administration is, but how broad it is. The mm -hmm. different types of career opportunities that you can go into, the different types of industries throughout the past few weeks, really actually throughout the semester as it related to the human resources class, we've had a number of guest speakers to come in to talk to specifically that class on a Saturday, can you believe it? But to talk to students as related to the different types of areas within human resources, from talent acquisition, employee engagement, uh, let's see here, labor relations, uh, organizational development. But today's event really kind of captures not only just so much of healthcare at University Hospital, but more importantly now, the different industries that you can actually go into and how you can best utilize your degree. Tough question ahead, because I think obviously we all have been watching the news. We've been keeping up informed in terms of what's going on in society. We know obviously, I, you know, sometimes I, I turn on you know, the news stations and I've been seeing you know, and watching the trial with George Floyd. But in the midst of that also, then going through the struggle of an economic challenge in terms of businesses and overall operations collapsing, uh, in terms of this global pandemic that we're going through. So my question to you is in the midst of COVID-19, racial unrest and economic inequality, how does your organization continue to stay engaged as a socially responsible organization? Think about that for a moment. Natasha, jump in. So Girl Scouts is the leadership development organization for young women. Uh, we work with girls from kindergarten through 12th grade and building up their skills, their entrepreneurship skills, their, uh, their life skills, everything from financial management to outdoor um, environmental skills, building up their courage, confidence, and character. We've always done that. Um, Dean Stroy mentioned that I am a part of the National Girl Scouts of the USA 
Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Racial Justice Steering Committee, which was just launched on the heels of um, George Floyd's murder um, and all of the social unrest. I uh, had the opportunity to be on the receiving end of girls in the Girl Scout movement who were looking to me for guidance on how they could be socially engaged and aware and advocate for the issues that were important to them. Um, and it was telling that those girls whose lives, lives I touched 10, 12, 14 years ago were sending me pictures of themselves um, being at rallies and marching um, and saying, you know, I, I just want you to know that we're still socially conscious and all of the lessons and things that I learned in Girl Scouts about being community minded and civically engaged still live with me today, even though I'm a Girl Scout alum. Um, it's very challenging time for, for many of us. And it, it's particularly interesting for me because I'm a black woman, right? I'm a, I'm a woman of color um, from Caribbean, you know, background and, and descent and living here in the US and designing and developing programs specifically for young women uh, has been a challenge over the years, but it is especially challenging now. Uh, girls are looking to us for guidance uh, and the programs have to be relevant and not just match their interests, but take into consideration all of the social unrest and racial tension that has, it, it seems like it's like balled up like a fireball almost over the last two years. Um, we're in a period of reckoning and girls and their families are choosing how they can be engaged and what's important to them. Um, so we are staying relevant and being uh, relevant and there for them and still delivering on the Girl Scout mission. Uh, COVID aside, uh, Dr. Zilliard, yes, I am here in my car because the, the business of Girl Scout still has to happen in order to support all of those programs. We do it in a way that is now online with the Girl Scout cookie program. The girls are building their own websites and marketing their sale and still gathering at booths safe, safely with masks and face shields and gloves and you know hand sanitizer and all of that um, so that they can fund their, their programs that they want to be doing this summer and into next year. There's, I'm told there's a travel trip coming out of this. Um, these girls are going, are planning to go to Costa Rica on a mission trip um, in July of 2022. And that's what they're using the proceeds from today's sale um, to go towards. Absolutely, well said. I want you to also think on that, Marsha, uh, but before beginning, you know, I just wanna you know, piggyback off what you just simply said, Natasha, wow. So it's not just simply so much of how can we as engaged responsible citizens, you know, play that role in terms of stepping up to the plate in these difficult times, because that's really what it is. And it requires, mm -hmm diverse opinions, diverse perspectives, but more importantly, diversity around the table to have these painful conversations. They're certainly not gonna be comfortable, but we have to start having these conversations at the forefront to talk about it. And organizations, agencies, companies alike, they play that key critical role in terms of questioning, what are we doing about this particular problem? How are we addressing this particular issue? It's not so much in terms of about how much money are we making as a company? Are we staying above flow? Are we making sure that we're keeping the lights on as an organization? Yeah, that's all great and that's all operation. And we have to keep the lights on. We have to make sure that we have engaged employees. But somewhere deep down, it starts at the C-suite level in terms of thinking about, okay, but are we more than just our mission out there? Are we right. more than just the bottom line? Are we more than just simply how much dollars are we overall raising? Are we actually overall concerned about what's going on within society, within our country or abroad, right within our own community? It starts at the community level. So I just wanna take it over to Marsha to jump in. In the midst of COVID-19, racial unrest and all this economic inequality, um, 
as you know, work sits at the core of it. Um, and over at the North Youth Once Up and Career Center, um, I could say my biggest issue was COVID-19. And as soon as it hit, it was, when will we get out of this? When will we get out of this? And how do we prepare young people to only op not only operate in this, but be successful in this? And so March, I would say 16th, I was told we would never return to work until further notice. And immediately in my mind is how do I then begin to plan programming to not only get young people to work, but empower them to believe in who they are as well. And so proud to say City of the Newark, City of Newark was the first program to pivot and run a 100% virtual program for well over 2000 young people and pay them a stipend um, and engage organizations all across, not just the city, but like I would say New York, New Jersey, the tri-state area. And so, it was just exciting to just see young people really believe in themselves, find ways to, to access, um, to find access to get into the program and then even lean on us for food supplies, for technology, anything that we could do for them. And as, as an organization, we did as well. So even in the midst of this, we wanted to make young people walk out of this feeling empowered, secured and knowing that they too had a place in this thing we call the world. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one key word that you just said, you know, or a few, you know, being able to, during levels of uncertainty, be able to pivot, you know, you have to be able to kind of move with the storm. You have to be able to know how to be able to pivot when there are challenges that are going to arise. And throughout, you know, this degree program, whether it's at the undergraduate level or even at the master's level, you're learning how to pivot, whether it's, you know, just going through Zoom classes and learning how to navigate that through those challenges professors coming up with creative ways to keep students engaged. But more importantly, once you finish this degree, how do you pivot in terms of careers? How do you pivot in terms of you know, uh, a racial reckoning that we're going through? How do you pivot through challenges of making sure that your organization is gonna still run smoothly? Because there's gonna be those challenges along the way. But as Marsha Armstrong just simply said, learning how to be able to pivot. I think this important question really applies to all of our panel members, because you know there's certainly light at the end of the tunnel, right? When you finish this degree, you have so many questions uh, in your own mind. Will it all pay off? How will I overall make it? Uh, will I be able to survive out there? Then once I finish this degree, once I put down that pencil and finish up the last exam, I finish typing up the last research paper, I get through my capstone project, those students that are at the master's level program, once you finish all of that and the Zoom sessions and everything else, but what we want to know and what the audience would definitely love to know from you guys and in terms of what advice would you give to our current SPA students if they wanted to follow in your footsteps? Let's go with Catherine first. Okay, so um, that, I think that's a really great question. Um, and recently um, I've been engaging in this conversation um, with many of my coworkers. Um, they're also very young in the field and uh, studying nonprofit and even my sisters. <laughs> um, and so what, you know, my biggest takeaway throughout my journey um, was uh, being very intentional um, about the steps in my life and where I wanted to go. Um, and that's not very easy, <laughs> um, but you really have to take a few steps back, think about the person that you are, where do you wanna be? Um, I started my journey in the United States when I was at the age of 17, and I actually started studying nursing, and then I switched to business law, and then I switched to business. <laughs> and I was trying to navigate you know, who I am, what do I wanna do, where do I see myself in five, 10 years? Um, and I was not in a place where I could answer those questions as yet until I actually um, started to do research, you know, much more in-depth research and ask myself very specific questions. And that's when I came across the SPA program um, because I just knew I wanted to help communities. I wanted to do more. Um, I wanted to be more impactful with my work. And so um, I just didn't want to get a degree and sit behind the desk. Um, I wanted to do the real work. So, um, you know, I did some research, I met with Dean Stroy, and I was immediately as soon as she explained the program, I just knew, looking at my questions that I asked for myself, this is where I need to be. And so once I started the journey with SPA, um, it just opened up many different opportunities. 
um, internships and I did several internships. And then I asked myself the next question, where do you want to work? And, um, you know, I did internships with city council. I did political internships, um, nonprofit, and I landed in the nonprofit field because I realized that's what I was really passionate about. Um, but I was still working full time um, at my corporate job. I was still uh, going to school full time. So sometimes, you know, it's it's really hard and you want to come um, you want to um, section things off. Okay, I'm gonna focus on school right now. And then I'm gonna focus on my career. Sometimes you just have to do it all together at once um, and put in the hard work and uh, really push yourself um, and ask yourself those questions. Um, and it's not easy, especially when you know you are an immigrant, a woman, and if anyone is in the, you know, those shoes just as we are, you sometimes have to work a little bit harder. Um, and it's it's not a joke. Um, I'm like the only person sometimes of a certain race or color at board meetings, so um, or gender. And um, we're now getting into those spaces, and it's great. So I think you know it's a perfect opportunity um, for current students to really, you know, as you're in your um, finishing up your degrees, start to think about those internships and be intentional about where you want to go and who do you see yourself. And, you know, I know there's only requirements for maybe two or one internship, but try, you know, maybe two or three or four um, and try to pick companies that match values that you have. Um, and right now in COVID, although, you know, it's a very, you um, there's a lot of um, things that are not so positive that have come out of COVID. On the flip side, you know, in human resources, there are a lot of positives. There are now the playing field. There are um, you have access to so many people because of technology and Zoom. And there's just a just a ton of jobs that have opened up in the market. Um, and even nonprofits have pivoted completely to online. So now if you are living in Newark, you could actually have a job in Philadelphia. Um, so those are things I just, you know, encourage you to start thinking about and be intentional, ask yourself questions, you know, who are you and where do you want to be? Um, and what type of organization do you want to work for? Sorry, that was long, but I'm really passionate about uh, this stuff. No, and, and no worries. It certainly was evident. And you have to be passionate about it. Anything you do, you have to do it with passion. You have to do it with grit. You have to just, you know, stay focused. And there's so many ways, you know, uh, often at times, it just in listening to what Catherine was simply saying, you know, there's no elevator ride up to success. You know, you have to just take the stairs one step at a time to get there. And you might even have to go through a detour. Uh, I just asked, since, you know, time is not on our side, you know, that we be brief so that way we can move on to the, Q&A portion of it and, you know, students that are on, please make sure that you are typing in questions in the chat box area so that Director Story can lead us in that meaningful conversation. So let's go over to Ashley. Yeah, so I'll go back to um, that feeling of being uncomfortable until you're comfortable and taking that risk. Um, and then also always thinking about the future because I was a first generation student and uh, my mom, she was very old school and she thought, you, you, you know what, be a medical assistant, then be easier. You can get it like, you know, a couple months. And I'm like, no, I'm going to go to college. Like, this is what I want to do. And um, she didn't give me a lot of direction. I really had to find out for myself, you know, what college was about and what opportunities it would give me. Um, and I think something that I didn't do was kind of prepare myself for my future. I just did the expectations of the small program. And I think that um, what students should be thinking about is, okay, I got this internship. Now I have to start thinking about if this is gonna be my career field or should I dip my fingers into something else? And taking that risk, like even if you're volunteering for a couple of days with someone um, to know whether or not you like that field. And then also I know the interview process is very rigorous now. There's video interviews that you're recording yourself. It's very uncomfortable, you know, and preparing yourself for that because 
when I started applying to other jobs after I'd been at university hospital for five years, I didn't know how rigorous that interview process was. Um, and I really had to sit down and feel comfortable recording myself and um, figure out what will be within the next steps in my future. And also, you know, maybe I don't want to stay in New Jersey, you know, maybe I should apply to, to Florida, you know, it never hurts. And also, um, just having something prepared where you could really represent yourself and the achievements that you made um, so that you could really confidently express what you did. Um, and also reaching out to people. I always tell Professor Dillard, you know, you have my contact information. I don't mind at all if you share it with all of your students. <laughs> have them come to me for any advice too. Um, so feel free to talk to people because I think advice is important um, and there's no questions that you shouldn't ask or feel embarrassed to ask. Absolutely. Stepping out of your comfort zone, networking, building yeah. your social capital, going beyond just simply textbook learning. I'm a fan of it. Theoretical frameworks are great, but you've got to build that social capital. You've got to feel uncomfortable and it's going to feel uncomfortable, yeah. but you've got to do more than just simply studying for the quizzes, the midterms and the finals and writing your research papers. In today's right. age, you've got to have the networking locked down. Let's go to Marsha. Um, the first thing I'd say is just to stay humble. Um, I think sometimes we get in these roles and we forget where we came from. So we have to stay humble and always, as we as we walk in a door, sometimes keep that crack for the other person to come in. I remember my grandma would say, your gift will make room to you, uh, room for you, because that's what the Bible says. And so I just know that to be real in my life. And um, I would also say like, um, don't, don't lose your footing when things get tough. Um, as it gets tough, like you're going to elevate, you're going to continue to elevate through these moments. And grit is really, really key as we continue to grow. And so I think when we think about um, just being that leader, being that employee, being that executive, that's what it, it takes grit, it takes humility, and it just takes openness as well. You just got to be willing to listen sometimes. Stop, own your stuff, listen, and grow. I like that. And then we're going to go into Natasha, but just, you know, uh, remaining humble, right? It sounds so easy but not forgetting where you came from, not forgetting those challenges, not forgetting that someone actually out there paved the way for you. So the higher up you climb, don't necessarily forget that. The wonderful salary, the title, all of that, the personal assistance, the executive assistance, but don't forget where you came from in the end. Let's go to Natasha. Unmute yourself, Natasha. There we go. Our... Um Vice President of these United States, Kamala Harris, uh, said something in her opening address about, um, I am, I may be the first female vice president, but I will definitely not be the last. And I walk into work every day with that same mantra in my head. I it may be the first African-American CEO of this council, but I definitely will not be the last. So in order to own that for myself, I remain open. My cell phone number is public. My email address is public. I answer my own social media and LinkedIn. Dean Stray knows pro this probably better than anyone else. When she calls on me to do anything, she gets a response within an hour because that's the kind of leader and mentor who was there for me that I then want to be there for someone else. So I, I'm open. Anyone who wants to be a Girl Scout CEO, pick up the phone, call me, email me, text me, send me a message on LinkedIn, and I will help you prepare yourself for this journey that I've now taken. Absolutely. Well said. Well, I just want to thank all of our, you know, panel members for joining on a Saturday. It's not easy to get everyone, you know, excited on a Saturday, especially when I start now seeing the sun kind of creeping out and everything. But, you know, these types of discussions are so, you know, critical. It's important in terms of your learning journey. And I've always said this to my HR class, you know, hence the reason of incorporating for this semester guest speakers. 
Because again, there's some classes where, yeah, you, you're going to have those finals and, you know, you're going to have to really cram hard in terms of the study. But then there's some courses that really hit at the practitioner model to really, you know, make you and start allowing you to focus on, well, what is it that I really want to do? How do I overall unlock my own potential? Wow, do I even have that potential? Do I have that confidence? And this HR course, hopefully, allow the students to be able to see that by networking with you know various panels that we had to come in. So I want to turn it over to Director Sharon Stroy, who's going to lead in our Q&A session. So Director Stroy, it's all yours. I'm not sure if Director Stroy might be, it might be a little choppy. Sharon, are you there? Obviously, you are doing your job because the question in box one and I think the panelists for answering some of this. So I'm Sharon, it's coming up a little choppy. I'm here. Okay, my connection is unstable. Okay. Can you hear me? Not really, no. Let me video. Can you hear me? Nope. It's still a little bit choppy. I can hear you, but it, you know, here. Can you there. hear me now? Yeah. Let's try again. If not, I'll fill in. All right. Okay, so let me just kind of jump in and keep it moving then. So uh, let's see your first question from Aisha. And again, just for the you know, sake of time, we won't be able to answer everyone's questions. Uh, and I'm just asking for our panelists to you know, also chime in in the chat box just to make sure that all of the questions were answered. But obviously keeping in mind of everyone's busy schedule, Natasha got to get back to selling cookies. I want to make sure that all of our panelists you know, at least can just kind of chime in through the chat box so that way no student is left out in terms of not having their question answered. So if you could just kind of go through that chat box area just to see if there were any questions that were you know pertaining to you. But let's just go to IH uh, first. Let's see here. What would you suggest for someone currently working in HR at the support and associate level but is looking to advance within the field of HR? Anyone want to take that particular question? Go ahead, Ashley. Um, I think that's such a great question because I was in the same um, situation where I was a HR representative for about a year um, and I was ready to move on to the next level. So I think what was important for me is to open up a dialect with my supervisors as to um, letting them know that uh, I was an intern and I moved into the HR reps and position. And I prepared a, basically a document that showed every um, process improvement that I did for them, everything that I went above and beyond so that I could show them and actually support my argument as to, okay, I've been here for this long. What would be the next opportunity for me in this organization? Because I like working here and I like the, the organization, but I need to also look out for myself and I want to be, you know, move up in my position. And that's when they were able to actually create a position for me. And that's when I became the HR specialist. So definitely having that open conversation, um, making sure that whatever position you're in, making sure that you are going above and beyond and having them see that um, definitely will support you into growing an, into another position. And in some organizations will be like, you know, we can't offer you another position. And that that's, you know, the way life works. So if you feel like you're not advancing in that position, definitely look elsewhere. Um, because that also happened to me when I was an HR specialist, I wanted to grow again and they didn't have any opportunities for me. And that's when I, I knew I had to leave my organization. And there's nothing wrong with it. You know, that's the great thing about it, you know, going through, uh, as I like to call it, that's one chapter of your life, that whole career movement, right? And, and you realizing that, you know, there's so many opportunities out there, but also reaching the, you know, breaking point of realizing that when you have to kind of move on outside of the organization, 
And we all come, we've all had, you know, those questions in our own mind in terms of when is the right time. I saw uh, an important question from student Marie Paul. And I think, you know, a lot of non-traditional students have gone through this. You know, we have a diverse group of students currently attending SPA. And we have traditional age students and we have some non-traditional age students. So the question that she posed was, what would be your advice for non-traditional students besides an internship opportunity? Uh, so Marsha, do you wanna jump in? So I'd say um, just go against that myth that internships are, jo are just for traditional students. Let's start there. I would say that there is opportunity to go into an internship as a non-traditional student. I started in an internship as well. Um, for the city of Newark, literally just having a job, taking some of that time, giving it back to the city and started to create systems to help other programs. So debunk that myth that you cannot be an intern. Um, if you have a, you can work with organizations, you can make yourself available um, to assist in ways that you may have expertise. Sometimes it can even be within the spa area. Like, right, I feel like even when, when before I thought of an internship at the city, I was open to working for spa as well. What can I do to help and learn and grow in these areas? So I would say, um, don't be opposed to an internship if one comes your way. It may be paid or it may be unpaid but know that it will help you learn things that you yourself may not have thought that, may think that you already know, right? You'll learn um, just tons of different things. And then you may be able to provide insight, right? Um, so I think a lot of times we go in and we, we, we feel like we, we know this thing. And then there's one little thing that we just missed. And that opens the door to something else and something else and something else. So just be ready, be, as Natasha said, be open go in any area with open arms, knowing that something is there for you. Um, it may not be at that moment, but when the moment arrives, no one can take it from you. And I would say that that's the way to go about that. And we all certainly know it will arrive. It will come there. Sometimes they'll knock on your door when you're not even prepared or when you're not even looking. You know, success will follow and it will come with it. So, you know, you find those different ways, but internships are certainly important. Even something simple as this, events. Everyone knows this about Dillard. Dillard likes to bring a lot of folks together. And I have no problem with invite they all smile here, the panelists, but they know this about me. That I think, you know, that's a great way to follow up in writing, send an email to the panel members. And, you know, this is my name. This is what I'm doing. This is the year that I'm in, in terms of my graduate level program or undergrad. Here's my work experience. Here's my resume. These are some of the things that I'm looking to do. Uh, can I meet up with you for coffee? I mean, Zoom now, obviously, there's no excuse of you're too busy. With Zoom, you know, obviously being in all of our lives now, from the comfort of your own home, you can set up a Zoom meeting. But because of time, hold on, Ashley, I just want to get to this important question. And I'm not sure who would want to tackle this question, but I know a lot of students have gone through this. A lot of professionals might have gone through this. So I just want to read this follow-up question to you guys. When you first started your job, did you face imposter syndrome? If so, how did you overcome it? Or what allowed you to become comfortable with being uncomfortable? So did you ever face imposter syndrome? Uh, Marsha, you wanna jump in? And then maybe Natasha, I see she's holding her, her head down, but maybe we can go to Natasha too and just be brief in your responses too, by the way, but go ahead, Marsha. Um, absolutely, it exists. Um, you just, feel like you're not, you're not good enough. There are just times that it just, and, and I would say, honestly, Dillard was the one that helped me out. I would go to him with like questions and he'd, he'd look at me like, you know this, you got this. And so that helped me to deal and move through my stuff. But a part of it was just owning it, owning that that was happening to me and then standing in front of someone that would hold me accountable. So I would say Dillard was, and probably still is my accountability partner because I'd send him ra random emails to kind of lift me out of places when I feel like I'm, I'm, facing that thing and it's about to take me out. Absolutely, go ahead, Natasha, you wanna jump in? So it said, I've been asked this question about imposter syndrome before and really it's psychological. It's a pattern where people doubt their accomplishments and very early on in my, within my first month of being a Girl Scout CEO, another woman of color, a volunteer, sent me an email that basically said, don't be a token Black CEO. And it was an awakening for me to remind me that I'm here for a greater purpose 
and not to doubt my accomplishments, not to doubt those 20 years, 21 years now of service to this organization, because I'd be cheapening all of the work that I have done. Not to let, not to let that her get in my head and have me doubt why I'm here and whose child I am. Uh, that, that, whenever that question comes up, I reckon that to who am I? And I am here to do this work. And there is a God that is bigger than all of us and all of this that already knows where I am going to be in this world and what impact I'm going to have. So I take that imposter syndrome conversation completely out the door. Absolutely. And, you know, just to kind of piggyback off that too, yeah, you, you go through those moments in life, students, audience members, where you question yourself, you question your own ability. Uh, sometimes you might listen to what I like to call naysayers that might try to block your way or block your blessings, but they can never block your blessings. They can't block your way. You know, you're going to face opposition. You're going to face people that's going to actually say, you can't do it. You won't do it. You, will, you won't ever get it done. And that makes you work harder. It, you know, somehow you have to be able to realize that, you know what, I'm going to have some challenges along the way. This spa degree has prepared me. You know, being able to network with like-minded individuals, surrounding myself with positive people, that's something a textbook can't necessarily prepare you for. That's something a quiz, a midterm, or a final exam can't prepare you for. It's through those life challenges of climbing along the way. I, too, have been there where I've sat in a room where it, I was the only person of color, Black man that looked like myself in the room. And times where people thought I was a student, not the professor. So I've been in those situations. I've been in those situations and being in executive level positions in the healthcare world, you know, but you get over that after some point and you realize that it's deeper than that. What's the legacy going to be that you're going to be leaving? Again, I want to use this time to thank everyone for joining us, thanking the students, particularly my class, shout outs to the human resources class although I think I bugged them about it, making sure that their attendance is key and I'm looking at to see who's all attending. But I also wanna thank students that were not a part of my class that also uh, showed up. I know uh, Director Sharon Stray, she put in some you know, upcoming events that are, so I'm just kind of presenting on her behalf Then our next event will be uh, Earth Day 4, 422 at 4.30, Sacrifice Zone filming screen and discussion. And just so that way you know everyone, then in terms of looking up different spa events that we offer here at the School of Public Affairs and Administration, make sure to check out the Facebook account, check out the Instagram and Twitter, make sure that you go onto the Office of Public Engagement to see upcoming events. It has to be more than just simply academics. You have to get involved as a student and also as an alum. So let me take this moment on behalf of Sharon Stray to say that on behalf of the Dean's Office, Dean Charles Menefield, as well as on behalf of Director Sharon Stray, Director of the Office of Public Engagement. We thank you for coming here to join us, taking out some time from your busy schedule to join us on a Saturday, a nice Saturday, that is, you will still have the remainder of your Saturday to be able to get out there and enjoy your time with family and friends and run errands. But I, we feel as a school that this conversation today was extremely important in terms of impacting your lives. I'm looking at some of the positive feedback in our chat box. That's how I knew it was effective. It was meaningful. We had to have and continue to have conversations such as this, and it's important. But again, I thank the panelists because you are making that impact. You are making that indent. You are making the difference and somehow showing that you haven't forgotten where you came from. You realize that it's this important work that you're doing that's not just you're shaping yourselves and your family's lives, but you are somehow making that difference in our current students' lives. So that way, when they too walk down that aisle, they too step foot on that stage to receive that degree, they're gonna feel just as inspired to come back to SPA and to also sit in on panels. And hopefully when we get back to some idea and sense of normalcy, we will be able to once again do this in person. I thank all of you for showing up Again, continue to stay safe and take good care. Bye. Thank you so much for inviting us.
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a great rest of your weekend. All right. Bye. Back to Dr. Dillard, the girls are like banging on the car. Like, um, you're supposed to be working. The 